Uh, good evening, everyone. As Olivia so kindly mentioned, my name is Alicia. Um, I work with the Niagara Plains Conservation Authority at Falls Falls Conservation Area, so you can't ask for a better place to be. Um, but before I get started this evening, um, with the stories I'd like to share with you and, and the stories I'd like to hear from you as well, I wanted to begin our evening by acknowledging that the land upon which we stand upon and gather this evening is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live, work, love, laugh, play, and prosper here today. Um, this territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the land that's protected by the dish with one spoon. Today, this is a gathering place and a home to many First Nations peoples, Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples. And by acknowledging the land upon which we gather um, today, it reminds us of the great standard of living um, that those peoples experienced prior to colonial contact. It recognizes the resources upon which we rely today, which is so important here as we head into the harvest season in Lincoln. And it acknowledges the friendship of indigenous peoples with colonial peoples and settlers. To recognize this land is to acknowledge the debt to those who were here before us, and to recognize the responsibility that we all carry to respect and honor the intimate relationships that indigenous peoples have had with this land for time immemorial. For thousands of years, people lived on this land. They walked on the earth gently, and they offered their assistance to the first European settlers, some of whom we'll talk about this evening, and the travelers that came upon this land. They shared their knowledge on survival, how to get through cold winters, how to survive the climates of this place. And for that, we owe them so much. We seek a new relationship as we head into this season with the original peoples of this land, and we honor this land and respect it for that. I hope that we can be guided by love and right action on this land as we transform our personal, institutional, and our relationships that we have with this land and Indigenous peoples upon it and our neighbours. So it's really important to me to recognize that as we go into a, an evening where we're talking about our landscape and the earth um, that we're sharing here today in, in, the, in the town of Lincoln and in Niagara. Um, and so it's important for me to contextualize myself as well. Uh, so as I mentioned, my name is Alicia Powell. I work for the NPCA, but I'm also a settler student scholar. I'm currently finishing up my PhD at McMaster University in Hamilton, and I work with uh, small rural communities across Canada particularly within Manitoba, and I work with Métis communities and First Nations there as well. And I've had experience um, working in the healthcare setting um, and studying healthcare and the relationships that individuals have uh, with service providers, healthcare providers, and the system. And a lot of my work has to do with landscape, it has to do with rurality, it has to do with urban spaces and urban landscapes. And so much of what we talk about and what I study has to do with landscape and the way that we engage with it. So it's really important for me to recognize that and it's important for me to recognize who I am and practice uh, uh, reflexivity and to acknowledge where I come from and the lens through which I'm delivering this, this um, talk this evening and the perspectives that I share. Um, so uh, some of the conversation that I overheard as we were getting started this evening is about who we are and um, who we descend from, who our ancestors were and where we come from. It's a question that we're asked a lot now um, as we're in this COVID-19 time. And so for myself, um, I reflect upon the fact that I am the fifth generation to grow up on the same farm in uh, the town of Binbrook, Ontario, just outside of Hamilton. I reflect upon the fact that um, I've carried settler privilege as I've gone throughout my life, throughout my studies. I was educated within a settler system, um, and I'm fortunate to have reaped the benefits that have come from that land that my family has uh, prospered off of. Um, and I recognize that as I go into this evening, and I think it's something important for all of us to recognize as we talk about our landscapes and where we come from. So a quick overview of this evening, I'd like to get to know you as well. We're a small room, and for the folks who are watching at home online, um, I want you to ask these questions too, and to kind of reflect about who you are and the relationship that you have with this place, with this landscape. Whether you're here in Niagara, you're here in Lincoln, um, or if you're somewhere else, if you're abroad, the relationship that you have with this land, and perhaps the relationship that you've had on the land that you grew up on, the land that you are most familiar with, whether that's a town, a city, a very urban place, it doesn't matter, the landscape is all around us and we're all a part of it. Landscape is cultural, it's historical, landscape is physical and material, it's ecological and geological, and we'll talk about all of that this evening. I'll share with you a little bit about the NPCA, what it is that we do, and what a, sh a watershed is. 
a lot of the context that we speak about in the conservation setting has to do with the areas within which we operate, and that's within our watershed. And so I'll share with you a little bit about that, and you might be familiar with that already. I'll share with you a little bit of our natural heritage, which includes our geological history, and I have some friends who are friends of rocks, so hopefully you are as well. Um, and I'll share a little bit of our ecology with you. We are situated in such a rich place, and we're so fortunate to be here. I'd love to share that with you, as well as a little bit of our bi uh, biodiversity that's present here. Our landscape is complex, and we're fortunate for that. I'll share with you a little bit of our cultural heritage and the space where I work at Balls Falls and some of the cultural um, history that's taken place over our landscape, and then I want us to think about human impacts on this landscape. What have we done and what can we do to improve it? And I'd love to share a little bit of a story and some anecdotes with you from my um, work with the NPCA. And to wrap up this evening by thinking about our relationships with the landscape now and what they can be in the future. So I've done a lot of talking so far, and I'd love for you to share with me and uh, with the group as well. Um, so I've kind of contextualized myself and where I come from, but I'd love for you to share with me what your relationship is with this land. Um, what do you do? How do you engage with the earth, um, with the landscape? And it could be through how you work. It could be your recreational or leisure activities. Um, it could be the research that you do or your curiosities. So I know we're a small group, but um, if anyone wants to share maybe a little bit about their relationship or where they come from, how they engage. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, to this land specifically, we are newcomers. We moved here in March. Um, but to the escarpment, we're no strangers. We grew up in Orangeville uh, on the Bruce Trail, so it's a familiar landscape at least. And uh, yeah, we're, we're quite at home here already. So it's been nice to, to learn about the area and meet the people who live here. Um, <clears throat> for myself personally, um, starting my PhD this week in sustainability management. So this is a significant interest to me, <laughs> um, especially in terms of the agricultural landscape that we find ourselves in. There's a lot of food and farming issues that have even just recently come to light. So I'm very, yeah, very excited to be here and to, to learn from you. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much. It's very interesting. I'm excited for you. Wow, there's a lot going on. Uh, a lot to learn and a lot that you know, so thank you. Is there anyone else who's willing to share? Sure. Well, uh, I'm from this area. I grew up here. Uh, I am going to show me some Six Nations. Um, and my day job kind of connects me to this area. Uh, I'm a history nerd, so I'm a, a manager at Old Fort Erie. Uh, which is uh, uh, owned and operated by the Niagara Parks. I knew it. <laughs> yes. So um, this type of uh, uh, knowledge is I'm just expanding. So um, I'm very familiar with all the heritage sites in this area. So. Wonderful. Excellent. Something, something learned, uh, I need to learn. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for sharing. Anyone else willing? Yeah. Well, we uh, we are a certified organic farm. We have uh, 11 acres. And a couple of years back, we planted lavender, and we had the uh, frost from hell, and we lost 50%. And instead of fighting it, we decided to work with the land instead of against it. So we moved forward in planting native plants that would work with our environment instead of against it. So we now have about 40 different herbs that were um, native to this area that are very difficult to find and leaving land to be fallow. Uh, one of the most exciting things that we found yesterday was a partridge walked into our front yard and we haven't seen a partridge in 14 years of our, our existence on that property and we know where he came from. We know that we had left three years of fallow uh, grasslands up and we know there's a nest up there and Every year we see new species such as this year, I think we're at six walking sticks. We have praying mantises everywhere. And just every, we have 14 years of certified organic land and every year we see something new come about. Um, and we had a star-faced mole. The star-faced mole, yeah. Yeah, the star-faced mole kind of this year. Out. And it was, it was just, it's incredible to see how our land, only 11 acres, is actually rebuilding itself and, and, and coming out and about. And we just constantly learn about what is native grasses and native um, plants and 
what works and, and so many weeds are not our enemy, they're actually our friend and it's just been incredible for us. That's so exciting. Thank you so much. I really, I would love to see the pictures of the start of the start of the mall. It's so cool. <laughs> love it. Um, so there's obviously a lot going on and, and our relationships are really rich and really deep and historical and they go back generations and our curiosities are growing about the landscape as well. There are things that are going on, you know, currently that we're inquisitive about. How can we grow better? How can we be more sustainable so that we can support our landscape and give back? And part of our conversation here is about reciprocity and about how to be reciprocal and have that form of relationship with the land. And I think that that's really important as well. And so we'll talk about that as we go. Um, and my next question for you is why you think landscape or the landscape here is important, um, or the landscape where you are familiar, um, and what is important about it. So we talked a little bit about agriculture, and we talked a little bit about growing, um, and about hiking, and our leisure activity and about the cultural heritage on this landscape and why people were drawn here in the first place. Um, so I'm curious to know why you think the landscape here is so important. The water is Black walnut. Absolutely. <laughs> Black walnut, there's a lot going on. They're pretty busy these days, dropping away. Um, and the waterways here, absolutely. Um, we're straddling two of the Great Lakes. We're very lucky to do to be here. Um, any other ideas? Really rich soil. Mm -hmm. Mineral rich soil. Absolutely. It's a major agricultural draw. A very fortunate discovery of those that came here to do that. Any other thoughts? Perhaps as you're traveling between Niagara and Hamilton, what is it that we're so fortunate to observe? And I get to drive up and down. You're from Hamilton. I heard someone mention they're from Hamilton. You get to drive up and down it quite a lot. Um, in Hamilton, we call it the mountain, um, but we're so lucky that we get to see the Niagara Escarpment. We get to have that as part of our lives. Um, it's something that creates interest on our landscape. It's certainly something that um, encouraged people to come here. It created it as part of our water system and part of our watershed. Any other thoughts about that um, in this group? Why the escarpment itself is so important or complex? And thinking about the, the corridor here between Hamilton and Niagara Falls, um, why is this important perhaps to us here um, within the municipality of Lincoln? Why is it important to um, you know, folks in Niagara-on-the-Lake as well and folks in Niagara Falls? Any ideas as well? There's some economic interests. The only reason I can think of is the limestone. Absolutely, yeah. certainly. Limestone is a major draw, and we can talk about that as well. Um, limestone is something that we harvested and have been harvesting and still do to this day. If you're here, you might feel the shakes and hear the booms wherever you are. Um, I know sometimes my desk rattles. So our landscape is important for that reason as well. There's a bit of a geological history. And so we have relationships with this land. We have relationships with the landscape. I know if the landscape were to change or if I were to be somewhere else physically, my day would be completely different. I start my day by driving into the sunrise and driving home into the sunset, and I'm very fortunate for that. Um, and getting to traverse this land and traverse this landscape is certainly a privilege, and there's a reason why our families and why we chose to settle here today, and that's really important to reflect upon um, as well. To share with you a little bit more about the NPCA and what we do and we have to do uh, with the Niagara Peninsula landscape and uh, certainly with the waterways here. So we're a conservation authority. Um, our conservation authority was established in 1959, so we date back uh, quite a while under the Conservation Authorities Act, which was enacted in the late 1940s following a number of different um, catastrophic water events, including Hurricane Hazel. We're actually, um, on, in, here in Ontario, one of the only provinces that was reactionary to major climate-related events and to major water-related events and floodings. Um, and so based on you know, the disastrous floodings of the Don Valley that happened in that period. People's lives were lost, homes were destroyed, uh, settlements and development was destroyed in the process. And so um, at that time, the government decided to create what is called the Conservation Authorities Act and uh, to create conservation authorities primarily in southern Ontario, uh, with some located further in um, the north central and further northern Ontario. And really, we are a uh, response to that. Um, the Niagara Peninsula watershed is over 2,000 square kilometers, um, and I'll show you the map of the space, but we encompass all of Niagara region, and our authority includes all of the waters that drain into um, certain waterways. I'll show you them, um, but it includes parts of Haldimand and part of Hamilton as well. So, um, 
we have about a quarter of Haldeman County and about 21% of the city of Hamilton's land um, is incorporated into our watershed. And within that space, there's over half a million people that we serve, and half a million people that uh, live and own property and work and engage in relationship with the landscape here. Um, the organization is governed by a board of directors and is primarily funded through uh, municipal tax levies um, from Niagara, Hamilton, and Haldeman. And so who we are, um, you'll see that I've got um, quite a bit of imagery in, in my slides. And um, the previous one uh, is a picture of a tulip leaf. And the tulip tree and the tulip leaf is our logo. And there's something that's really special and important about that plant. And there's a picture there of the tulip tree flowering. Um, but the tulip tree is a species that grows only in this uh, climate zone that we're located in, in this forest zone. I'll share a little bit more with you about the Carolinian forest momentarily, but um, it's a rare species, and if you see one growing in the forest, not planted, and our municipalities are wonderful because if you ask for a tree to be planted, you can sometimes request them, and some of my neighbors have tulip trees growing out front, um, but they're quite rare to find in our forests today, um, certainly within this zone and certainly beyond, um, so that's part of the imagery that's there. So. The tulip tree really represents um, the NPCA and, and this wonderful space in this landscape. Um, the map on the other side shows you the land mass that encompasses that the Niagara Plains uh, Conservation Authority watershed encompasses. So that portion of Hamilton, Haldeman, and all of Niagara, as you can see. And we're talking about waterways and waterways bringing people here and being significant in uh, certainly in settlement, um, certainly in times before colonial contact. Um, but the waterways that we speak to and that our, our systems drain into are Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, and of course the Welland River is another major system, the 20 Mile Creek, which runs through uh, Falls Falls um, in uh, Jordan and out into Lake Ontario, as well as the Niagara River. So it's quite a complex water system and contributes to our complex uh, landscape. But a watershed is essentially an area of uh, land um, through which water flows across on its way to reach a particular place. And so those final resting places in our watershed are the two Great Lakes that are Peninsula Straddles and um, the Niagara River. And so there are small creeks and tributaries, some of them might run through your property or the property that uh, your family is on um, or that you grew up on or played on or went to school on. And those small creeks and tributaries and streams flow into larger systems like the 20 mile, the 12 mile creek, uh, the Welland River and uh, out into those larger water systems. And so we're looking at both surface water that collects after um, our heavy precipitous event, and we're also talking about groundwater as well. And groundwater moves in, in interesting ways as well, and drains out into our major lakes and water systems. The map in front of you is essentially the 36 conservation authorities that are spread out across Ontario. Um, we're fortunate that um, these were created and enacted by our, our provincial government so many decades ago. Um, and as you can see, most of them are in the southern areas. I'm just curious why you think most conservation authorities are concentrated down here, and then we have our friends way up in northern Ontario. Why do you think this is the area where conservation authorities were established, and why their boundaries are there? Is it because there's so much urban planning going on, you have to preserve, whereas in the north it's already kind of wild, so you don't really need to manage it as much? Absolutely. The conservation authorities uh, were created and established to really help to manage and control development and what was going on, human interactions with the land and their relationships with waterways, of course. And so a lot of what we do has to do with planning and permitting, um, flood zone mapping, floodplain mapping, um, and determining where is safe to be and where is not safe and not working with landowners uh, to make sure that if, uh, if we are developing, we're doing so safely. Um, so that's really the major response, but it's also to monitor water quality and many of our municipalities um, rely on the Great Lakes and some of our major water systems for their drinking water as well. And so that's a significant impact. So conservation authorities are concentrated where people are. And as you can see, I mean, when you look at the map of Ontario, it's, this is a small segment of the province, um, but there's so many watersheds. And it's really interesting. Those watersheds speak to la uh, landscapes. They speak to where water flows and where water goes. And of course, that has everything to do with the shape of the land. Um, and so looking at that, it's really interesting to see where all of those spaces are. And each of them are unique in their uh, history. Each of them are unique in geology and their biodiversity and ecology. Um, but the one thing that's all significant is that we are reliant upon that land and we are reliant upon that water to live. 
to have that government that was fast thinking and forward thinking at the time to really establish that. Um, it's been identified in a number of different international settings and national settings, um, you know, that having this model is really substantial and significant. So showing up a better close-up, I suppose, of our watershed here, you can see our portions of Hamilton and Altman. Um, the other thing that the NPCA is responsible for is managing lands as well. And so we're responsible for 41 different properties or conservation areas across um, our, our watershed. And some of them are located in Hamilton, the most significant one there. It's kind of where um, my history is, is in Binbrook, Ontario. Um, the reservoir there in Binbrook is really the headwaters of the Welland River. And so um, it's a small lake, it's a man constructed lake. It's the largest, we say, with a man made lake in our watershed or interior lake. Um, but it's about five kilometers long, and um, that man made reservoir is a great place for recreation. But it also has a dam that controls the amount of flow that goes through the Welland River. And so it's, it was very much so intentional when that dam was created um, in the very um, early 1960s, and the concept of controlling water flow through the Welland River system was important. Um, why do you think controlling water flow through the Welland River um, from that green mark there uh, in Binbrook outside of Hamilton um, down into Niagara, out into the Welland River was really important? And the idea is what's going on in the landscape that we would need to control water flow. Absolutely, agricultural activities. And we'll speak to it as we move along, but agriculture in this area is really significant. And some of us have ties to it. Certainly it's an important time of the season right here for us here in Niagara. Um, we are in, in, heading into harvest and you might have gotten stuck behind a combine or a tractor on your way here. Um, that certainly speaks to it. So throughout most of West Lincoln, as you can see as that water system moves through, that's the Welland water system, uh, Welland River water system, um, it flows through a lot of agricultural space. A lot of that space prior to settlement was wetland. And having wetlands in place helped to control water flow through the system. It helped to collect water after heavy precipitous events, and it helped disperse water in the dry season. And when settlers came, and when the earth um, and landscape was changed to uh, sustain agriculture, many of those wetlands and the forests and areas were cleared and drained. And when we did that, we created a problem for ourselves, um, where when after heavy precipitous events, there would be mass flooding events, and unfortunately, farmers' fields and crops and homes were destroyed. And so there had to be a way to control water flow through the system, and that was one way um, in the 1960s that was established to do that, was to control water flow, really with an agricultural purpose in mind, uh, and, and all the development that was taking place through there as well. So on this map, we can see what's going on here. We've got um, one really important property um, that's important ecologically in, bio, uh, in terms of biodiversity, which is the Wayne Fleet Bog. It's the largest remaining peat bog um, in southern Ontario, which is significant and really important to think about. And then we've got a number of uh, properties along the Niagara Escarpment, and, and we're close to one here today. Um, we've got places and properties like Balls Falls, which traverses different layers of the escarpment, beautiful cave springs, of course, Beamer Memorial Conservation Area, which is a fantastic site to see. Uh, migrating uh, birds of prey in the springtime. Um, and so we have a number of properties that traverse the mountain, as I like to call it. And then we have properties along um, Niagara's south coast, uh, which is down on Lake Erie. So properties like Long Beach um, and, uh, and a couple others there as well. We've got some really fantastic sites along Lake Erie too. And so all of these spaces contribute to um, to recreation and to active use and passive use on the land, but they also start to sustain and, and um, control and conserve um, areas of uh, property as well that are significant in terms of their ecology and biodiversity. And so in terms of water resources, the NPCA uh, kind of contextualizes our water flow three ways. So the water system that I speak mostly to is that of the 20 Mile Creek, so that's the one that starts just outside of the city of Hamilton, stays just along the top of the Niagara Escarpment, and through the 20 Mile Creek, of course, drains. Um, the 20 Mile Creek is the largest water system that flows, but it flows over the Niagara Escarpment and out into Lake Ontario. And then the system that I was speaking about that initiates in Binbrook, at Binbrook Conservation Area, the Welland um, River water system flows out into the Niagara River, and then we've got a smaller system that drains um, along that south coast into Lake Erie. So they're very diverse, they're very different. If you've traveled around Niagara, if you've cycled, if you've visited some conservation areas, campground sites, you'll notice a difference in the landscape and the difference in place. And a lot of that has to do with the way that our water is flowing and moving. So those are kind of the three 
uh, primary areas that we contextualize um, what we do on the land. And so there are a couple different responsibilities that we have as an organization, um, which is to establish and undertake programs and services on a watershed basis, so operating for the communities that we serve within our landscape, within the uh, watershed space, to further conservation, restoration, development, and management of natural resources, and to protect people and property by regulating, risk mil uh, mitigating development through uh, reviewing and commenting on different development applications, and ensuring policy compliance. And one of the things that's really important for us as well is communicating that and, and ensuring folks understand um, what it is that we do. So I mentioned 41 conservation areas. They're beautiful spaces. Some of them are hidden gems. That there's only enough space maybe for one car. It doesn't have a parking lot at all for folks to access. Many of them connect to the uh, Trans Canada Trail and to the Bruce Trail that folks can visit. And we're responsible for water quality monitoring, and that's something that's really important. Uh, it's an important part of our um, education programming and services that we provide um, with schools and students in our communities. We do flood forecasting. So if you're on the weather network and there's a big rainstorm or thunderstorm coming up, um, that part of that flood warning is issued by us or by the Conservation Authority in your uh, region. And we're responsible for permitting and water quality improvement. Um, it's a grant program that we operate through. We run our fundraising events. We deliver educational programs, and that's part of what I'm responsible for um, with the NPCA, and particularly at Falls Falls. And we work with different partners to make sure that we're able to do what we do um, and do so effectively and maintain our natural resources like our waters and our lands. Um, so we're responsible for ensuring clean drinking water here, both groundwater and source water protection for recreational opportunities and to maintain a healthy ecosystem, as well as protect species at risk. I'll share some of those with you as well this evening. Um, we provide different recreational activities. So if you've ever gone hiking at Cave Springs or come out to go paddling at Big Rock or visited a campground at Chippewa Creek or Long Beach, um, those are some of the things that we're responsible for as well. And we're part of a provincial mandate, as I mentioned. So here in Niagara, there are a number of really significant natural heritage features that we're very fortunate to have. If you've driven through Hamilton, if you've looked at any uh, recent social media posts, tourism in our region, Hamilton is a city of waterfalls, which is really cool. Um, we've seen more and more this season, more than ever, and I'm sure that my friends um, in the parks here and in parks in Hamilton and the different conservation areas can attest. Um, we have seen more visitor traffic that's been drawn to waterfalls and to traversing the escarpment than ever before. Um, so we've seen a massive influx in visitation simply for that purpose. Unfortunately, it was a really dry summer. <laughs> and that meant that there wasn't a lot of water over the falls. Um, but it's something that characterizes our space and that we're known for and that we promote through tourism. Niagara is known for Niagara Falls. That's why people come here, millions of people every single year. And so it's really significant for us. So City of Hamilton, Niagara region, we share a number of different waterfalls over the escarpment. The escarpment itself, um, as, as a segment of our landscape, is a significant piece of our landscape, is a significant heritage feature in and of itself. Um, we have the Bruce Trail System, of course, that runs through here, and we have some folks that hike in and that are familiar with it. Perhaps you at home um, have been able to get out and enjoy hiking along the Bruce Trail this season. Um, and we're part of the Carolinian Life Zone, and I'll share a little bit more about that, but there are over 125 species within the Carolinian Zone that are known as SAR, or Species at Risk, um, and over 400 species in the Carolinian Zone, which we are situated in, are considered rare. There's a number of different ecosystems. So we have beach ecosystems, forest ecosystems, swamps and meadows, alvars, open marshes, and of course, agricultural ecosystems. And we're also very fortunate to have an, uh, the ability to engage with urban landscapes and suburban landscapes as well, where we're able to engage with many people and communities and to encourage folks to come and enjoy our natural heritage features and landscapes as well. So we have a little bit of everything. And if you traverse Niagara region from the north coast along uh, Lake Ontario down to the south coast um, along Lake Erie, it's quite an in interesting ride. Uh, we have the Niagara River, of course, which is significant. We share international borders along it, the Welland River as well, and of course Niagara Falls, which are all major her natural heritage features here. We also have the 12 Mile Creek, which is known as the only cold water stream within our system. Um, so there are different species that can only survive in that water ecosystem as well. And there's a lot of work that different friends and partners, conservation groups, groups like Trout Unlimited do to help to preserve that ecosystem. A lot of hard work is done to maintain that. 
And so these are some significant natural heritage features in Niagara. I'm curious to know if you can think of anything else that's significant, any features that you know, you've headed out to to see, a particular tree or maybe a segment of trail, or maybe you've seen someone's post on social media posing next to or in front of a waterfall or a, a space that you were drawn to. Anything significant? I can think of a number of friends in front of various waterfalls. <laughs> Maybe looking out from an observatory or a platform over the escarpment. Any ideas? Anything that's important to you? A space that you like to go with your family or a particular trail? How about the Bruce, just up here near the Kinsman Park? It's really beautiful. Um, we went to Falls Fall. We've been told about a tree. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You've been told, you've heard about it. Um, I can speak for myself and maybe uh, working at Falls Falls, it's a significant place for people to get married and for people to get engaged. So we've uh, overheard the happy cheers, people are brought back to the same place. We've had folks return to get married where their parents or their grandparents have been married. And so some places like that are significant. Um, I'm always drawn to a particular tree in the forest of Falls Falls. It's kind of like my tree, that's where I go. It's um, important to me and when I lead hikes through the forest with the school groups and kids, I always talk about my favorite tree. And I'll share with you a little bit more about my other favorite tree. I guess I have two um, in a few minutes. So there are significant small microcosms uh, and places that we're drawn to that are natural heritage features that are significant to us, that we have ties to, that are important for us. Imagining walk walking with future generations or taking a loved one or maybe a visitor um, from out of the area to visit our trail systems or to go out onto the land or into nature, or perhaps to walk your own fields and say, this place is important to me because this is where I saw the partridge. This place is significant to me because, you know, this is where I got engaged. This place is significant to me because this is the trail that I walked with my grandfather when I was small. Um, so all of those things are important and contribute to our natural heritage and our personal relationship with natural heritage. Of course, none of this would be here if it wasn't for the Niagara Escarpment and how very important the Niagara Escarpment is. And so we can see highlighted in red the landform um, that the Niagara Escarpment is. There's um, hundreds of kilometers of trail that runs from southern Ontario up to Tobermory, um, across Lake Huron, um, over Manitoulin Islands, and then down over Lake Michigan. And so it's a really substantial and significant land, uh, landscape and land marker, and um, it's really created the systems that we see. Um, you can see how Ontario is divided. You can probably think of some of the parks as you're driving towards Toronto, where you see the Niagara escarpment that jut up uh, to the north. That's really significant. If you've ever traveled to Tobermory and explored uh, there, visited the grotto or Flower Pot Island, how beautiful it is and how substantial it is as part of the landscape. And so we owe a lot to this land formation of the Niagara Escarpment. Now I can go back for a second. The Niagara Escarpment was formed all oh, way back about 11,000 years ago. Um, within the last glaciation, um, what was known as the Wisconsin Glacier was starting to recede. And as it was receding, um, that glacier stripped away quite a bit of rock. Over 450 million years ago, though, the land that we're standing on was the basin of a tropical ocean. And that's why we have these layers of sediment that create the sedimentary rock of our Niagara Escarpment. That's why we have amazing fossils that we can take our loved ones, and take our school groups, we take our camp down, um, you know, into the gorge, into the valley, and we're looking for amazing fossils, fantastic trilobites. To think that that was created, that those things were here 400 million years ago, it's incredible. And to see that expressed in layers of sediment, as that glacier was moving across the land, it stripped away quite a bit, and that soft rock uh, deposit of those sediments was stripped away, and that's why we have this landscape, this landform. And over, um, over a period of time, over the 11,000 years, there was a great lake, the greatest lake of all, Lake Iroquois. And Lake Iroquois really went up to where our Niagara Escarpment was. Um, right to the lip of it, so along King Street here, um, right along the escarpment. That's where that great lake would have been. And we're very fortunate to have had that lake there and the types of sediment that are left behind where here in Niagara so much is being grown below the escarpment. Those microclimates that exist below the escarpment are so because of the lake, because of the rock face, and because of those soils, um, those deposits. The Niagara escarpment is important and significant because of the limestone that we've talked about today and all of those layers. 
And when we think about water moving over our earth and, and, and the waterways and the types of erosion that we've seen over time, we reflect upon the cap rock that sits there um, on our escarpment and how very strong it is. Does anyone know we've got limestone as a significant sedimentary rock and, and a significant proportion of our um, sedimentary rock in our layers here, our rock strata, but is anyone familiar with any other types? Or perhaps the name of the capstone that's so important. Dullestone? Dullestone, that's right. So Dullestone contains a little bit of magnesium. It's quite a light like uh, limestone, but that little introduction of magnesium um, makes it a lot stronger. And so that's why we've got this really significant cap rock. Um, I like to bring students down to view Balls Falls as a picture of the lower waterfall gorge. Mm, it's a little bit of a more uh, exciting day than it is today at Balls Falls where there's no water going over. Um, but in this picture we can see some interesting layers. Is there anything that stands out to you about those layers? Anything that a child might notice to differentiate the layers? The colors. The colors, that's right. Now the colors of the rock tell us a lot about the rock and a lot about the history of the rock. Does anyone know why we see some of those spectacular colors in the layers? reds, some kids say they see purple, blues. Any ideas? Why might we see red in our rock? Iron? Very good, yeah. So there is iron in that deposit. Very interesting what was taking place uh, at the time that, that those layers of sediment were deposited. That iron is oxidized, it's turned the stone red. And what about the blue layers? Tell the kids to think about the rooms of the parliament building. Yes. Copper, that's right. Uh, pennies aren't relevant anymore, um, but that's <laughs> copper inside of the, the rock as well. And so really the strata that we see speaks to the history, so we can go back those four, uh, 400 million years. Um, and what we're looking at is the, what's left over of the Ordovician period um, and Silurian period. And so um, we take a look at that and think about the millions of years of history. Now on a day like today, when it is not like this at all, but completely dry, I like to tell folks we're looking at 450 million years of history in the rock strata. And so really those deposits are important because what's created the Tuolumne Valley and what's created the growing uh, climates that we have along the top of the bench and below it has to do with what was taking place thousands of years ago and millions of years ago. And we recognize that our natural heritage features uh, reflect that and they show the history of the rock. Now our water systems change as seasons change, and what we can see is that we've made a significant impact on our land, that there isn't water flowing over it the way perhaps the early settlers would have seen it, and certainly not the way that it was remembered um, hundreds of years ago before the land was settled. And so that's something that we experience today um, in seeing those changes and fluctuations. We're also very fortunate to be um, a segment of the Bruce Trail here, we're part of the Niagara segment of the Bruce Trail. And the Bruce Trail is established for folks to be able to recreate, to enjoy the Niagara Escarpment, the amazing vistas that we can see from above it, and the complex landscapes that exist below. And the Bruce Trail extends across our escarpment, so many of our properties, as I mentioned, have a segment of Bruce Trail running through them, or that you can connect to, and from uh, Jordan and Vineland, you can connect uh, to the Bruce Trail as well. It's over 890 kilometers long. It's incredible to think. And there are friends that I have met, and folks that have come through our doors at Balls Falls to tell us that they're hiking this segment, and their goal is, their life goal, their bucket list is to traverse the entirety. And that's really interesting. It's interesting as well that the Bruce Trail is maintained and groomed and looked after by volunteers. And those volunteers might be people that have a special tree along the trail. Those volunteers might be somebody that walked the trail when they were young, but they have an affinity to the space and they have a responsibility to it. And for that reason, they're reciprocal and they're helping us to enjoy the landscape um, in a way that's recreational, but is also preservative as well. Faces and rock faces that we see in some places that are significant. Um, Cave Springs is one of our properties. Um, it's known for its fantastic hiking trails, it's known for its vistas, it's known for its rock walls and some of the history that's there too, and including some of the caves that were found. Um, 
certainly the settler history on the, on the site as well. Um, but it really represents an interesting area, and there are some rare species that can be found along our escarpment in some of these conservation areas as well. Um, migratory birds, for example, that call the space home for a short period of time. And we can recognize that certainly during migratory season. We work, for example, with the Niagara Peninsula Hawk Watch, which is a group of volunteers as well, people that are very excited and um, encouraged to see and to study the migration of raptors and predatory birds. Um, and Cave Springs is an important site, but Beamer Memorial Conservation Area is an important site uh, during the spring migration to observe that. And the reason why um, the birds are drawn to this region is because they're kind of lazy. And they're using the warm air that's being pushed up off the lake, pushed up against the Niagara Escarpment, and they're soaring over that. And so there's a corridor right along Niagara Peninsula, right in between the two Great Lakes, and up to and over the Escarpment. And one of the best places, and the warmest places, and the finest places to glide is right over Beaver Memorial. And so part of our landscape is contributive to migratory patterns, things that have been happening for thousands of years that we're able to study. And so that volunteer group, the Niagara Peninsula Hawk Watch, every year, every single day during migratory period from March through May, they have folks that are on an observatory platform counting every single bird and recording the species that they see migrating. So it's really interesting, part of our landscape that's important, and part of it that's informed by the shape of the rock um, and those beautiful updrafts that they rely upon to get up and over and out to where they breed. Part of our landscape that's really important is Niagara Falls. Of course, waterways and the ways that people traverse the earth are important. Why do you think Niagara Falls is so impressive? Why do you think it's so important to us here? Um, along the QEW, along the ways that we travel to get there. Why do you think it's important? Economically. Power? Yeah, absolutely. We're generating power. So that's significant. That's something that's been happening for a long time there that we've been relying upon. But it's also a significant source of our economy and our industry and what people are doing. It's something that, unfortunately, that's been significantly impacted um, tourism and hospitality um, by COVID-19. But millions of people are drawn here, not just for the waterfalls. Waterfalls are an attraction. Of course, it's a wonder of the world. But people are drawn to the landscape there as well, to hike the gorge, to see the glen, to see the water move. And it's always impressive compared to the 20 mile. Creek, when it's all turned up, Falls Falls. We like to call ourselves Niagara, Niagara's Other Falls, but Niagara Falls is the piece de resistance, is the reason why people come here. But people come here for ecological tourism as well. There are amazing, very rare species of bird that can be found there. Many people come here to have their big year to see if they can see as many diverse birds as possible. Um, and many people are drawn to the rock drawn to the escarpment and the ways that they can engage with it. And so ecological tourism is important as well. And of course, what else? <laughs> wine. <laughs> yeah, viniculture and wine grape cultivation. It's a time of the year where we love biking down the trails, and if you have them growing around your, your own fences and in your own yard, seeing those wild grapes, you know, the very first species that many uh, other species, the concords, for example, and wine grapes being based upon. Um, but viniculture is alive and well, and it's a significant part of our landscape. It's a, a major part of what we see when we're going down the road, when we're traversing up and down the escarpment. There are many Appalachians and microclimates that contribute to such an important and uh, impactful part of our landscape and part of our agricultural history and heritage. And there's also so much soft, soft fruit cultivation, none of which would be possible if we didn't have that layer of sediment and rock to have such a rich soil for those to be grown in. And so this is important within our landscape as well to reflect upon the complexities of having people here, of having this type of cultivation and this activity, and the economic impact that it has on our communities and our space as well. But aside all of that, one of my favorite things to tell folks about is how very important and very lucky we are to be situated here. We are in the middle of the Carolinian Forest Zone, which is the most diverse life zone of any forest found in Canada. And guess where there is more of it than anywhere else in Ontario? Right here in Niagara. There is more forest, there's more landscape, there's more green space and protected space here than anywhere else in the Carolinian zone in Canada. 
and that's because its furthest northern range is probably just a little bit north of Toronto. So it extends from here in Niagara, all the way around Lake Ontario, up to northern Tor uh, north of Toronto, and that's it. And so we have more green space here, more Carolinian forest zone here than anywhere else in the province. And so how fortunate are we to be in a space where we are surrounded, we're literally straddling two Great Lakes, we're surrounded by more fresh water than almost anywhere else in the world, and we're here within the most di diverse forest type in all of Canada. It's my mostly deciduous canopy, or broadleaf canopy, so we've got many deciduous trees, and some of them like the tulip tree, uh, which are rare, sassafras as well, and the pawpaw, and we're known as a space of extremely high biodiversity. What better place to explore, to become intimate with our landscape, to become intimate with our um, nature, to become familiar with nature and ecology and our environment than here? There's so much to discover. We run kids' programs and camps and uh, a, a daily nature school program. And every day, one of our young students asks, will we see animals? And the answer is always, yes. yes. We will, because we're living in an amazing space. Over 500 species here, I mentioned some of the, the stats earlier, but over 500 species in this zone are considered rare, which is really important. And we have a really high proportion of species at risk here. Now the MPCA, we have a staff ecologist, and part of what she does in the program that we run is to monitor some of these spaces and habitats that those species at risk uh, dwell within. For example, the Wayne Fleet Bog is home to Mesosaga rattlesnakes. That you didn't know that we had rattlesnakes here in Niagara, um, but there is a small population. So it's really important to think about these things, how extremely biodiverse, despite the fact that we see vineyards, there's a lot of industry going on, we see the rows of greenhouses which are so important to us as well here in Niagara, we have um, a lot of tourism taking place and of course development that's happening everywhere, but we are still the most diverse, uh, biodiverse space. We also have a number of different unique climate zones, which is important, certainly it's important to agriculture and to growing. We have some of the warmest and longest um, growing seasons in all of Canada, which is uh, considerable and important. And of course, all of that is dependent upon the Great Lakes. Unfortunately, however, as great as this is, and as much as I'm talking about all of this green space that we have, unfortunately, within the Carolinian Forest Zone, much of that canopy has been taken down. So forest cover has been reduced from about 80 percent um, prior to uh, rapid industrialization and settlement to about 11 percent. And as I mentioned earlier, many <laughs> wetlands were cleared, drained, and destroyed for settlement, agricultural purposes, and while about 30 percent of the landscape were made up of wetlands, we only see about 5 percent of our zone of wetlands now. And so we're very fortunate to have that, and it's all of our responsibility to make sure that those spaces are there are a number of different species at risk, and I've got a few of my favorites here. The eastern milk snake, for one, some flowering dogwood, and the bladder nut plant up in the top, and of course the state pot turtle. We see many different species at risk, including flying squirrels, which are really neat. The southern flying squirrel that we have here. And I have n had never seen one. I would heard about them, I knew that here along the escarpment where we have really large, wide trees growing was a great habitat for them. And I'd never seen one before and I didn't really believe it until one night I was headed out on a night hike with a bunch of grade six, seven, eight students behind me and of course everyone's being loud at the back. But up at the front, um, we were walking through and we had our headlamps on and we noticed the motion out of the corner of our eyes and we're walking along the trail and we turn our headlamps up and right above us, a flying squirrel uh, glided across the trail. And myself and maybe the couple students that were really interested at the front of the group, we were so excited to be able to see it in its natural habitat at nighttime as a nocturnal animal, um, spreading its uh, legs and its membrane across the trail was incredible. And so having moments like that makes a space so much more special to us. And for those young friends that were at the front of the line that got to see the flying squirrel, this very rare species, in situ, in the forest, in this moment, was very special. And hopefully it's a memory that uh, they reflect on as excitedly as I do. We've got really interesting species as well um, that grow on our wetlands, for example, the sundew plant. Um, and we also have the American elder, um, which is a species that, or is a species at risk as well, uh, which is important. 
We're home to many different insects and we're seeing a lot of those. We heard about the praying mantises and the stick bugs earlier. Um, so we're home to some interesting uh, to some interesting insects as well. And I love butterflies, the spotted artillery, of course, and the red admiral. Some of the more rare butterflies that we don't notice, perhaps, as much as we see our viceroy and monarch friends. Um, and speaking of the monarch, how important it is today we planted a pollinator garden um, working on a program in memory um, uh, of, the, of the monarch and how important it is and unfortunately the fact that the species is in decline and how important it is as stewards of the earth, as folks that have the capacity to plant spaces and to um, create habitat for them to be able to be sustained. So I always tell folks to look up and to look down when we're on the trail, when you're engaging with it and looking for things that are biodiverse. And there's a lot of history with the species that we find as well. I have the blood root here um, on display. It has a really interesting shaped leaf. Um, and that leaf, if you were to pick it to see what happens, um, what color do you think the liquid is that comes out of the, the leaf there? It's red. Yeah, it's like this coppery red color. So I like to leave a little drop of it on my hand when I'm showing folks when we're hiking along the trail. And that's how it got its name. But there are also historical uses and traditional indigenous uses of that plant as well. And the way that settlers know that plant and the way that we know the name of that plant has to do with the way that it was used to treat different blood-related uh, blood illnesses. Um, women's health were treated um, with the blood root. And so it's really interesting to think of that and to reflect on those histories of those plants and their memories and how they were used. And the fact that they're rare and only found in this forest type here in Niagara. I've highlighted wild ginger too. Everyone's so impressed to smell that rich, strong, spicy ginger scent. To think this is grown here, this is wild, this is native, it belongs here, and it does. And we have some really great um, places where you can experience that and see that growing. And of course, my favorite, the butterfly milkweed. When I say to look high and to look low, I think that that's really important. We have an indigo bunting uh, just perched on the edge of the tree in the last picture and in the middle of the blue spotted salamander, um, which is really important to us as well. We're known in this area for having colonies or, or sorry, areas where the um, Jefferson salamander is found, and that's a species at risk as well. Again, one of our responsibilities is to look for um, and maintain those habitats. And of course, one of my favorite bird species, the tufted titmouse, which we see all year long. Uh, they stay over the winter with us, and so one of the things that we do with the kids is head out and go bird watching them all along the trails, running our programs. And of course, the place where I'm situated that I speak to and interpret best when it comes to our landscape is Balls Falls Conservation Area. Um, we all have very um, you know, distinct memories of space, and this is one space that's very distinct to me, not only because I work there and I'm there almost every single day, but because there's so many memories that are generated at that site as well. And there's a long cultural history on that land too. And so from the aerial uh, view, we can see this is probably um, around 2010 or so, um, shortly after our um, Center for Conservation, the modern building just on the right-hand side of the screen was built. And you can see the 20 Mile Creek flowing through here, and where it goes over not one but two cataracts. And the first cataract, the upper waterfall, we call it, is just on the top of the page. It's um, covered by the trees. And then the lower cataract, the lower fall, which is an 88 foot drop, um, a really great space to uh, look at the rock strata and to look for um, trilobites if you were to head out into the gorge to look for fossils. Um, and this site is an interesting site of settlement. Um, there's a rich cultural history as well. And um, my curiosity for you is, why do you think it was an important site for settlement? Why do you think people were drawn there? Um, of course, it's called Balls Falls. It's a very possessive name, but um, the first European settlers on that land were the Ball family. Um, why do you think they were drawn to that space? Why would anyone be drawn? Sawmills. Uh, pardon me? Sawmills. The sawmills, yeah, absolutely. Very good. And what were they going to run their sawmills using? Water. Water. Yeah, they are relying on that very heavy, amazing, rapid flow of the 20 mile creek. But you can, if you came here today, you say, well, uh, but yeah, so just in the bottom corner here is the grist mill. They also had a sawmill uh, just up right alongside where you see um, the water drop off. And they had a woolen mill as well there. They settled in um, 1807 and had that grist mill up and operating in around 1809 and operated that, uh, that mill and, and really uh, prospered as an industrial village and had people settling there over 101 years. Um, which is really interesting. And then later on, um, into the 1840s, they started to lose water power. 
and they had to do something else. They had to put it in a smaller water wheel. Um, that grist mill was grinding, uh, grinding mostly grains like wheat and corn and barley and oats. Um, and the sawmill was productive. In fact, most of the land uh, that we see that's been cleared was cleared, except for very precarious trees along the escarpment. So we do still have some older, uh, older trees and species there. But a lot of that land had been cleared for the sawmill. But around the 1840s, they started to lose water power. That that early is 1840, and they they just been operating for a few decades. And the idea of what was going on that they might have had to start um, to change the way that they ran their mills or operated. The 20 Mile Creek originates just outside of Hamilton, similar to the Welland River. And it flows all the way along the top of the Niagara Escarpment. And as early as the 1840s, they started to lose water power because that's how rapid settlement and land clearing was for, um, for agriculture and for farming. And so they operated, they put in um, a steam engine at their, in their later years, in the 1880s. And by the early 1900s, the village had slowed down and they didn't have enough water power to operate and it wasn't really profitable for them anymore. And so we can see in that 100 year period, the process of losing water power has everything to do with what was happening on the land around that water system. The clearing and draining of wetlands, the drawing from the 20 Mile Creek perhaps to irrigate in other places and farms um, along the upper escarpment was important. And I say that they kind of contributed to their own demise because they kept trying to make the mill larger. They put in additional millstones and they were grinding. They went from grinding 1,000 barrels a year to over 7,000 barrels of uh, wheat per year. Um, and in doing so, by calling for more grain from more farmers from further away, as transportation was improved, that they could get things closer and, and ship things out further, they were actually contributing to the demise of our own water system. And so that's the experience that we have with the land today. And so people are very disappointed to come, you know, on September 16th and see that there's no water flowing over those falls. We can't turn it on. We have to wait for it to rain um, because that original water source has been depleted. So there's a lot going on at the time. Um, they tried to industrialize the space. They actually had the site surveyed to create a small village. Um, and Glen Elgin, as it was called, never came to fruition. Um, but you can see some of these uh, old photos really showcase the space in its heyday and how very large the mill is. It's, uh, it was a lot larger in those times. It's about half the size that it's shown today. And show some work of them digging out uh, their water wheel and the sawmill along the creek as well. It was a completely different time and a completely different landscape. Uh, it would have been so interesting to see what it would have looked like. So we've talked a little bit about what we do on the land, what the place that I work in and, and know, at, uh, know now as Balls Falls, uh, what it looks like today. What do you think the human impacts are on our landscape? What have we done over the last 200 years? What do we have to do? Any ideas on our uh, impact and what that's done to our landscape and how it's changed it? Just this week, an article was published about um, how the world hasn't reached any of the 20 biodiversity goals that were set in the last 10 years. So that's that's one huge impact of biodiversity loss, as you pointed out earlier. Absolutely. Yeah, we're not reaching our goals. Things have been set up for us. There are expectations and. Certainly there's will and there's capacity in many places to, to reach those. Um, so the question lies, uh, why those haven't happened? In driving to get here, have you had to go up or down the mountain? Have things changed over the last 100 years? I'll give you um, maybe an anecdote. I live close to um, the Walmart stairs in Hamilton, and there used to be a gondola that went up and down the escarpment to get people up and down the escarpment to get to work into uh, Lower Hamilton. And of course, that was taken out in the 1940s or so. Um, but the, the pathway where that gondola used to be remains. And now our landscape is marred by all of those roadways um, going up and down the escarpment. And when I drive up and down the escarpment, I look at the space around it and what did this look like before. Um, and moving people is important. Um, but what have those roadways done um, to lessen our green space or perhaps to contribute to things like climate change and the loss of biodiversity in our forest space? So we've certainly done quite a lot. Any other ideas about our landscape? What what impacts we've had on it. 
We talk a lot about invasive species and those impacts. We talk about shipping. Of course, we have the Welland Canal that was created between the two Great Lakes. One of the things that we deal with in uh, maintaining parks and properties and green space is um, some inappropriate uses that can be quite destructive to um, ecosystems, to habitat, to biodiversity. Um, you know, using things like dirt bikes and ATVs on trails that aren't meant for that, um, or foraging new trails. So the Bruce Trail is the Bruce Trail, but there are places where folks have gone off trail and diverged. Um, and, and that has a considerable impact as well. Even um, the very act of hiking, if we're um, walking through muddy or wet areas, we might pick up some friends, um, say some seeds of garlic mustard, and carry those with us to the next place that we go walking. And so invasive species can spread that way. If we're not cleaning off the bottom of our kayaks or the tires of our bicycles or riding on, we can carry those with us too. And of course, industries um, that rely on landscaping, um, that rely on the delivery of soil, and there's quite a bit of industry that relies upon landscaping, the movement of soil and sod um, here in Niagara, of course, um, that contributes to all of those impacts as well. We see somebody dumping their bait. Um, recreating and fishing and being part of the land that way is important, but we need to do so responsibly. And so we've kind of shared a little bit about that and, and can recognize our impacts. Do you think that there are positive relationships between people and the environment, and can we have a resp uh, responsible, reciprocal, respectful relationship with the land and our landscape? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's what we try to do. Yeah. That's our goal. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that's so special. It's time consuming. It's a lot of work. It's, um, you know, it's a dedication. It's a devotion. And, um, and certainly kudos to you for doing that. And the successes that you've seen are so important. Yeah. Um, I like to ask this question after talking about um, you know, human impacts on the environment and invasive species and things like climate change, but I really stole the question from a really fantastic Indigenous scholar and scientist named Robin Wall Kimmerer, and she introduces her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, and it's really fantastic. I've got it here if you haven't seen it before, um, but she speaks about how she was teaching. She teaches in upstate New York. Um, she was teaching a class on ecological sustainability, and she talks about in her book, she asked her third year students, these are students that have been um, through the system, they've learned a lot about science, they've learned about ecology, um, and she asked them, um, you know, can people have a positive relationship with their environment? Can we be reciprocal? And the vast majority of her 200 students said no. And the question that she asks in her book is, how can we go forth having a positive, sustainable relationship with the environment? How can we encourage good relationships with the earth if we don't believe that it's possible? And it's almost an existential question that if we can't be sustainable, if we can't enter into a positive relationship, then what can we do? It's fatalistic. And the reality is that we can, and the stories are here amongst us that it's possible. And that's really important to instill that we can have these positive reciprocal relationships. So giving back to the land and our landscape is so significant and important. And so one of the things that we do, and I'm very proud of and love to be a participant in, is learning on the land and learning with children and sharing my love of this land uh, with young folks. Um, and, and walking the earth and sharing stories and seeing those curiosities become peaked. And so we're really fortunate that we have a space, we have a conservation area space that we can do that in. And you know, growing up and raising families and being um, at home on the farm or engaging in hikes and being out and recreating in nature is important. Not only is it therapeutic and good for mental health, that's known as well. Um, but one of the things that we do is encourage folks to get out and recreate and have positive relationships. And over this past summer, and you've probably seen in the media as well, you know, folks being encouraged to go out and, and recreate, to hike, to be one with nature, and to do so respectfully, you know, taking what you take out and to be responsible when you're there. Don't litter, for example. Um, there are so many known positives of being outside and to engage with natural spaces, like improving our memory and cognition, restored mental energy, just the stress relief of it all. I think my favorite thing about the forest is on a warm summer's day, smelling the smell of the warm pine needles beneath my feet as the sunlight trickles in through the canopy. I think that's so therapeutic. That's an experience that I've had since childhood. And, you know, it warms my soul to this day. And I, I bring other people and I bring my students through to say, just smell the smell of the pine needles in the sunshine. Isn't it amazing? And I'm sure you can think of those moments as well. It improves vision, you know, getting our eyes off of the screen and looking at things and, and sensing depth and color is important. 
creates uh, sharp thinking and better cognition, and it actually improves mental health and uh, lowers the risk of early death, and that's um, been studied. So there are many things that we can do in our space. We're fortunate to have this landscape that we can be um, uh, agriculturally viable, that we can be sustainable as well. We know that we have an important um, tourism asset, an important economical asset in our landscape here in Niagara, but there's so much more that we can be doing uh, to promote positive relationships. And one of the things that I like to share is uh, kind of a concept that I learned um, from my friends up in um, Nottawa Saga Conservation Authority. They created a space, uh, they call it a free play forest, and we call ours an, a forest playscape. Um, but we've created a natural space where kids can just go out. You know, there are some rules, but you can do as you like and you can experience space and we're not making a significant detriment on our environment. So um, when the Conservation Authority took over Balls Falls and it's situated there just behind the Centre of Conservation, um, a lot of the land had been cleared, of course, for, um, for the Ball family's industry and what was happening. And so at the time, we planted a monoculture white pine forest. That was in the 1970s. Planting monoculture isn't a good idea and there was a lot of tree death that had happened as a result. So we cleared out the dead trees in this pine plantation, um, anything that could be hazardous. Um, and my second favorite tree is the tulip tree, which grows right in the middle of the space. But we put up um, a natural um, cedar split rail fencing system. It kind of looks like a maze, and the children get to negotiate their way through the space um, to set up for it to engage in the space. We have loose parts for them to play. Um, we have um, some obstacles set up for them to negotiate, to climb, work on our coordination, uh, grow some fine motor skills. Um, but this becomes a space where we're getting to know the land, that we're independent. Um, we don't have a parent or a teacher advising us, telling us what to do, where we can make decisions, we can engage in risky play, um, and become one with, with nature. And so this is something that we're particularly excited about, um, to start integrating into some of our programming, and uh, for days, visitors, for families and guests that are visiting to explore and engage in as well. And so after we spend time there, spending a couple hours with the group, um, the inquiries, the curiosities, the questions that come, the desire to search and learn more. Some of the questions that we're being asked as educators are ones that we can't even answer because they're so complex, because we need to research it, and it becomes a process for us to engage in our space as well. So there are some important things that we can think about in terms of conserving our natural heritage features, preserving the spaces that we love so much. Um, one of the things that we do is maintain these conservation areas and are always looking for ways to maintain and to um, create natural green space corridors as well. And improve habitats on our own property. So we've heard examples of that already. Those weeds are our friends. Those natural native species are our friends and they belong here as well. They contribute to the insect species, the mammal species, the amphibians, and our favorite snake species as well, and reptiles on our properties. Um, and we can work collaboratively with different partners. So working with the local conservation authority, working with conservation clubs and groups and volunteers, like some of the ones I've mentioned tonight, um, to help not only engage in citizen science and to help do some of that research, counting the birds as they fly over is one great thing, but there are things that you can do at home. Um, there's some really great technology that we can integrate into our lives to help do that too. It's always a great opportunity to plug the SEEK app or iNaturalist, where you can log your observations of the different species of plants and animals and insects that you see. And lastly, of course, it's instilling passion, a sense of place um, and responsibility in the next generation, and that's something that, um, that we think is really important. There's a few different projects that the NACA works on, like the Niagara River Remedial Action Plan. So this is an international partnership to improve the water quality of the Niagara River. And of course, we're always relying on folks to help us in volunteering and joining us, cleaning up the trail. I know friends like the Bruce Trail um, Conservancy, some different clubs and groups um, like Niagara Hawk Watch, like the Lambert Conservation Committee, um, and many other field naturalist groups and naturalist groups in our area rely upon volunteers. Um, and they make a difference, so I have to recognize and thank the people that have helped us to do so many good things and to preserve our spaces um, and our cultural history as well. So I just leave you with the parting shot um, of Balls Falls in all of its glory, the 20 mile creek flowing over, it looks a little bit different uh, today, but I encourage you to enjoy the seasons and to see the changes um, of our landscape over this fall season, over this harvest season, and I thank you very much for joining me this evening.